In the year 1993, I knew two things to be unequivocally true. Number one, I was 16 years old. I knew my age. Number two, I had a killer look. I, I, I had it all together, but I think it was, it was like a seven, right? Not like a six? No? Six? It's all subjective beauty, isn't it? Um, but much like my goatee, I had issues making connections. And, and for me, like... <laughs> But I think many teenagers do, right? I don't think I understood the big picture. I was very enthusiastic, but I didn't know how to focus. I didn't have the mindfulness to focus my enthusiasm. Case in point, I was really into the environment, or so I thought. And I'd volunteered for this group to go door to door, raising money, canvassing to stop the repeal of the Clean Air Act. But I wanted to get to as many doors as possible, so I drove my Mustang all around town <laughs> to get to every single house. It just seemed more efficient that way. So, you know, the head and the heart were there, they just weren't necessarily talking. But I'm also a kind of kid who was very lucky to be put in front of a teacher who literally changed my life. And I don't just mean changed my professional trajectory or my intellectual interests, she quite literally transformed how I see the world entirely. That woman was Carol DeVito, and she taught a European history and an art history class at my high school. And I can pinpoint the very lecture she gave that blew my mind. And it was nothing especially fancy, it was just a banal lecture, and anyone who's taking an art history class in college or high school has heard this before, the difference between a Romanesque arch and a Gothic arch. Very simple. So she says to us this, a Romanesque arch is this semicircular, stone-heavy thing, and it's really low-slung and it's heavy. So, okay, for the quiz, I got it. And then she goes on to tell us that Gothic arches, conversely, are these very tall, spindly, elongated, an anort, uh, uh, elaborate uh, arches. I say, okay, so the Gothic is pointy, the Romanesque is semicircular. Okay, back to the Sega Genesis, I got it. But, but then she added something I didn't expect, which was context. She explained to us that Romanesque churches are located on the countryside, and oftentimes would be subject to attack. So these buildings had to simultaneously function as houses of worship, but also be garrisons to protect people. So all of a sudden, that kind of heavy stone arch thing had some programmatic functionality. She then went on to say that, conversely, Gothic churches are located in urban environments. And you could imagine living in 17th century Paris, you're in your tiny apartment, you've got no running water, there's no electricity, it's kind of horrible. You'd leave your apartment, this tiny little hovel, and you'd walk into what would be the single largest interior volume you had ever seen in your entire life. And you'd look up and you'd see these thin little spindly arches supporting looks like paper-thin glass walls, holding up a ceiling that only if the divine could be real could such a thing happen. And that moment kind of blew my mind because it occurred to me that those arches that she'd shown us were not aesthetically drawn. Their shape was not the result of someone's preference. It's not because they were pretty, they were the result. They were the artifact of a process. They were the result of a series of forces pushing down on this arch, physically, conceptually shaping it. I mean, imagine the structural forces, the economic forces, material forces, in this case, theological forces, all pushing to create this very shape. And each shape is different because it's got different circumstances and different jobs to do. And that kind of shocked me because I'm sitting there looking at my classroom, my car, my house, because it just kind of occurred to me that things kind of happened a priori, that someone poured water on earth and this building just was. It was just always there, that this ceiling looks the way it does because it does. But it occurred to me in that moment that these things were designed. Architecture represented a kind of a frozen moment of a series of decisions made by people, some good, some great, some enlightened, that affected us as a people. And that was fascinating to me. It was so fascinating that despite the fact I could speak so quickly, I didn't go to college to become a lawyer, much to my parents' chagrin. I went to Wesleyan University and studied art history with a concentration in architectural history. Huge career prospects. <laughs> my, my immigrant physician father was thrilled, as you can imagine. And to really make him that much more pleased, I graduated school with not a single ability to draw or do any math whatsoever, I decided to become an architect. Because I believed there was something more, and I worked really hard, and I applied, and I somehow made it to Harvard University's Graduate School of Design to get my master's in architecture. And within about six months, I was miserable. Now, just to be clear about this, you have to understand you're doing multiple all-nighters. I was reading nothing but Derrida and post-structuralism, and I was designing buildings that looked like my colon. <laughs> but, 
Now, let me be clear, this is not an indictment against pure intellectual exploration. I think it's a fantastic thing, and I support that. But I would say that unlike, say, the other art forms, architecture has that wonderful duality where it has to exist both in the public square and as a personal form of expression, right? It's both art and science together. And so I sort of felt like I was missing a piece of the context, right? For me, architecture is inherently a public endeavor. It's something that we build for other people in the public square to ideally make the world a better place, or at least a better looking place, potentially, right? But I felt that the larger my architectural vocabulary grew, the smaller the audience I actually was able to talk to about my ideas. And it was, really, it was really hard. And I remember this moment, like, it, really, my father, who was just trying to help, he's like, hey, Dee, listen, when you come home this summer, maybe you can help your mom and I redesign the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. My stomach dropped. I, I was two years into graduate school, about $100,000 in debt, and I didn't know how to renovate a bathroom. But it's not just my incapacity that for horrified me. It was my approach. Literally, I'm like, okay, renovate the bathroom. We're gonna... Is it a bathroom or a room of bathing? Perhaps the relationship between the toilet can change to the sink. And, we, and my poor dad's like, it's just when I'm on the toilet, my knees hit the, the, the toilet. And when your mom comes in, she does her makeup. Her, it's, just, it's just, can you just make it larger? We were, he was trying to help, but we were, we were just crossing paths. Um, and if I'm going to treat this TED Talk like therapy, which I fully intend to, uh, <laughs> My, my kind of architectural rock bottom came a year later. I was then now three years into a three and a half year degree. My coursework is behind me, right? It's now my thesis. It's my turn to give my opinion about how I want to personally participate as a practitioner in this field. And I got nothing. Literally nothing. I'm sitting there staring at my screen. It got so bad I found myself trolling Craigslist for a way out. <laughs> and this is where the story gets kind of dark. I'm kidding, it's not... <laughs> <laughs> that says more about you guys than it does me, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, but in all, seriousness, in all seriousness, my girlfriend showed me an ad on Craigslist that said the following. Do you like architecture? Can you talk about it? Do you want your own TV show? Send us a tape. And you know you're in bad shape, and you're like, that's a perfectly reasonable idea. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's set up the camera. And so in my living room with a Canon ELF 1.4 megapixel thing with a little three-minute movie function, set it up, explained to the camera that I had done the math, I checked what my student loan payments were going to be, and I found out what a first-year architect's going to make, and I figured a TV show could help kind of bridge the gap a little bit. That'd be great. <laughs> but and actually, in all seriousness, what I did say was that uh, I did love architecture, and that I find myself, when I'm in a well-designed, beautiful piece of architecture, I'm as happy as I was as a kid in a playground, but it just seems to me that my heroes, my professors, the people talking about architecture, talk about it like a combination between an actuary and a cult leader. And they're interested and they like it, but they're not really interested in talking to those who actually use it in a way that you might actually understand it or actually enjoy it more. And I felt like I could help. So I sent the tape off, went back to my thesis, and that was that. And, and quite literally, astonishingly, two weeks later, I found myself in Silver Spring, Maryland at the Discovery Channel headquarters describing, dis discussing the terms of my new show, which would be called Extreme Engineering. <laughs> now, granted, I'm running away from the elitism and the myopia of the ivory tower, but this wasn't exactly what I had in mind. It feels like, it's like a Gatorade commercial, right? You know, it's a bit, it's a bit much. Uh, but they said, but they said, look, look, Harvard, calm down, Danny. We're, you, you know, this is not a symposium to seven people. This is a cable television show for millions of people. We've got to reach an audience, okay? We've got to think big. And by the way, keep in mind, our competition on National Geographic is mega structures. <laughs> and they're competing on History Channel with modern marvels. And I said, guys, I get it. I know. We've got we to we gotta talk, we talk about it. But it's not just size. It's not just about quantification, right? There's nuance in design. Can we think about that? And they said, you're right, Danny. You're right. We're going to change the name of the show to Build It Bigger. <laughs> uh, FYI, if you get your job off Craigslist, not a lot of leverage your first year. <laughs> not, not, a lot, not a big seat at the table, necessarily. And, and, and here I sit, now we've got a bigger problem, right? Now we're talking about who's got the bigger tower, the longest bridge, the deepest tunnel. And in a sense, it's the most absurd way to talk about an art form, right? Can you imagine any other art form where we look at quantification and scale, the superlative is the criteria to establish quality? Can you imagine looking at a painting being like, that Picasso is so wide. <laughs> That's amazing. So wide. Ah. Uh. 
Or like, like a beautiful poem, it's like, this is, this is my poem to you, it's super long. Like, <laughs> you would never do that, and yet, I felt like we were reducing architecture to purely these issues of quantification and scale. And, and on top of that, they said, look, the other problem is the audience doesn't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about that. We got five commercials every hour, and by the way, any one of these shows, you'll notice right before the commercial, you'll hear something like, if the beam doesn't get into place, it could mean disaster for the project. <laughs> Has anyone ever been on a construction site? If the beam doesn't get into place, they put it back the next day. I mean, they, they just, it just keeps going, right? There's no disaster to be had. And I really struggle with this. The idea of fake stakes and quantification to the point of losing any sense of subtlety or context or culture or nuance. And I will never forget this. My first year, I mean, here's an example. My first year on the show, we're doing a show about the Alhambra Tower, this beautiful, interesting tower in Kuwait, super tall building. I'm standing on top, and they're pouring some concrete, and I'm looking in the hole, they're pouring the concrete, and I can hear in the back of my head someone saying, Danny, talk about how many megatons of concrete are being poured into this wall and how many 747s it would fill. Which I always found so strange. Who, who knows how big a 747 is? <laughs> Unless you're like interviewing for a job at McKinsey, you don't need to know how big that is, and yet our TV show was always curious. Anyway, so the idea was, yes, it's important how much concrete is going in there. That's a piece of the puzzle. But I was more interested in when the concrete dried, what was the shape of the wall going to be? And how might the geometry of that wall represent something about the culture in which it's being built? And how might, for example, the path of the sun in Kuwait impact how the geometry of the building might make the office building a better office building? And how might the stone they clad the wall with might represent a kind of mosaic building technology that's historic to the place? What an amazing story! But I couldn't tell it because I was breaking the cardinal rule of television, you see. Show, don't tell. You can't stand around and give a lecture on TV. You've got to actually get into it if you want your audience to participate with you. And so at that point, we kind of sort of found our diagram for the, t for the television we wanted to make about architecture. If I wanted to talk about the wall, I had to go get to the wall. So that meant getting in a bucket and having that bucket tied to a crane and having that crane fly you out over nowhere. And by nowhere, I mean nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Full-on Willy Wonka elevator style, right? Like, and just to be clear, that wall, to put things in perspective, that's us down there. But you'd swing in. You get real close, you'd hope some poor Nepalese man could catch you. <laughs> you'd get closer to the wall, you'd really now, hoping that Nepalese man's got a good grip, you would do the one thing you were never supposed to do, which by the way, number one is look down, and then number two is to jump out of your bucket and then onto the scaffolding. Yeah, by the way, in Kuwait, there's no OSHA, so it wasn't a big deal. But then what we would do is we would get into it. I would physically get my hands dirty applying the stone mosaic to the concrete wall. The sense being that if we could ennoble, if we could discuss the craft, the how the wall is being made, not just the size of the wall, that would enable us to talk about the why. Why the wall is the way it is. How is this wall different from other walls? And how does the story of this wall reflect details and nuances about this culture? How is this wall inextricably tied to the place in which it's being built? Now, it doesn't also hurt the fact that I'm a nervous Jew afraid of heights. That also makes for decent TV as well. That's, by the way, an image of just hiding fear. Just, just, just keep it in there. But for the better part of the next five years, I got the opportunity to travel to over 55 countries, hanging off skyscrapers in Chicago, walking on top of bridges in San Francisco, hanging off of places in China, having panic attacks in Vegas, Really, basically, so long as I stood near the edge, I could basically say anything I wanted, right? But the reality of what our show tried to, tried to get at, yeah, I know, it's awful, right? Just awful. Um, but what we tried to accomplish was to somehow respect the content in such a way that we believed the audience did, in fact, care about it. Keep folks excited by dangling me off the side of the building, but fundamentally, the idea was architecture doesn't exist in a vacuum. Architecture is grown of a place, and if it's good architecture, it both challenges and comments and supports the location in which it's being built. So what I want to do is I want to kind of show you guys a little bit about what we did. Because we tried not just to look at architecture, but to read it. You know, we're perfectly happy to believe you can read a book and extract multiple layers of meaning, but we seldom think that that meaning can exist in the built environment, but it's there. So if you would, come with me for a moment to Abu Dhabi. This is a show we did about an amazing building. Now, Abu Dhabi, you might know, is an emirate, the sister emirate to Dubai. Dubai had its famous rise and infamous fall. 
And Abu Dhabi was kind of having its slow rise. And with their big kind of coming out party, they'd won the right to house the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, which is a big race. It's Formula One, right? It's, it's like NASCAR, but they turn left and right. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's a big deal. It's pretty big deal. And yeah, I know, I was pretty blown away too. Uh, and in order to celebrate this big race, they built a hotel where the race cars go through the building, which goes to show you what oil money can do, right? <laughs> but that's just it. My interest wasn't in the ridiculous race car whizzing by the building. And by the way, having stayed in that hotel, not great for catching a nap when a car decelerates from 200 miles an hour. It's not, it's not super nice. But for me, it was about looking at the building and understanding what made it different from another hotel. I mean, does that look like a courtyard Marriott? What's happening to the top of that building? You know, and for me, it was fascinating that the architect, a guy named Hani Rashid from Asymptote Architects, when he came to Abu Dhabi to look at the site, he looked at the history of Abu Dhabi architecture, but he also looked at their fashion. You know, look, look at that guy on the right. What's he wearing? He's got a dish dasha, right? Is that white because it's fashionable? No, it's hot, right? And that white reflects the solar radiation, it's, it's, right? It helps him in the heat. And is that dish dasha loose or is it form-fitting? Does he hate skinny jeans? No, I mean, it's, I mean, there's obviously cultural reasons why, you know, hiding the body is important, but it's a long flowing robe with a gap between his body and the fabric because there's airflow, right? It's called the stack effect. The very same reason when you light a fire in your chimney, the smoke goes up, not into your living room, because there's a pressure difference, right? That national, natural pressure difference is what he's leveraging to keep his body cool. So if wrapping the body was an effective way to deal with the desert for thousands of years, could you wrap a building? And in this case, this steel and gla glass grid shell that wraps the building creates that gap where you literally have natural vortices cooling the building. I've been in the building, you touch the glass, it isn't that hot. And each and every one of those glass panels, as the building moves below, like a dish dasha, sort of imply what's below it. But those panels, all 5,200 of them, if you look closely, actually have a polka dot, a frit pattern, a ceramic polka dot on them, such that it blocks the heat but lets you see through it. So the architecture is solving an environmental function by day, but architecture is also about expression. It's about poetry, it's about ambition. And so if the panels block the sun by day, as the sun begins to set, something else happens. Right? That flowing robe of a grid shell starts to express the building's ideas, and if, God forbid, the Ferrari team wins, the building can talk about that, right? <laughs> but for me, what's fascinating is this is a wild, strange-looking building, and yet it represents the history, the fashion, the climate, the culture, the, econ the economics, the future, the ambitions, the hopes of Abu Dhabi, all in one form. And because the architect paid attention to those issues, it literally shaped and formed the building in a way it could not have been done otherwise. Which is very different from the tallest building on planet Earth in Dubai. That's Burj Dubai, Burj Khalifa. Why, why do we build tall buildings? Right? We have them in Manhattan because we live on a small island. You don't have them here, right? Because you have space. Are, are they running on a desert? Have you ever seen the view of the desert from the 20th or the 80th floor? Kind of the same. <laughs> but I will tell you, after being on the road for years, literally, I think it was about the third or fourth year of doing this, it occurred to me that there was another construction project going on in my own backyard that no one was talking about, and that was the World Trade Center site. And as a New Yorker and someone who was downtown that day, it seemed to me that I had oddly kind of developed the skills to become a kind of architectural filmmaker, whatever that is, and there was a story to tell that we weren't telling. And so I was fortunate enough to put together a group involving the Port Authority, the Discovery Channel, Science Channel, Steven Spielberg. That was a name drop. And <laughs> it's a big one though, right? That's good. And we were able to create a program, a six hour film we made called Rising, Rebuilding Ground Zero, which chronicled, chronicled the rebuilding of the buildings at Ground Zero. But fundamentally, our challenge was not to fetishize the size, how big it is, how expensive, is it late, what they're building, but to look at what are they building? What are the specifics of the design, and how can we better understand them? And one of the biggest challenges, of course, is Tower One. You probably know this, the AKA the Freedom Tower, right? This is a building whose height is, anyone know? 1776. That's right, not just a height, but it's a date. The date at which all white men declared their freedom, right? So it's, it's an important date. <laughs> we've, we've since amended it, generally speaking, but you know. But it's, it's odd to me, right? So this is our symbol of our freedom, right? Our response to the terrorists. But, but what happens if the night before, by the way, they just finished this, the spire like a couple months ago, but what happens if the night before they're putting up the spire, iron workers went out, they had a late night, woke up a little hungover, and they, and they missed, it was 1775. 
Has America's response to the worst domestic attack since Pearl Harbor failed? Have the terrorists won? Is the symbolic value of the building now evacuated? Would you even know the difference? Architecture isn't symbolic. Architecture isn't something you read at the placard and point out. Architecture moves you. It impacts you. It literally physically affects you. So for me, the height of the building, while important, is not the critical piece. The critical piece for me is how does it actually function as a building? How does it tell the story of its place? In the case of the architects who designed the new building, Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, they looked at the original tower, which was a rectangle, right? A square, 200 by 200 feet, extruded up. And when they started designing the building, if you cue the animation, they started with the original tower, and look what happened. They began carving the building at the corners. Are we able to cue the animation? No? It's just a wall of silence. <laughs> no? I bet you can do it. There you go. So if you look at the tower, right, you look at the original tower, look what happens from the bottom of the building. It begins to carve itself up and create a form, which as you might imagine, is wider at the bottom and small at the top, which by the way makes a lot of sense, right? If you're building a building, you wanna have a strong, secure building, you wanna have a big, wide center of gravity and a smaller building on top. But they could have shrunk the building a number of ways, right? They could have done a sort of a wedding cake like the Empire State Building, they could have done like the Sears Tower. Why did they cut and carve the building as they did in the corner? Well, if you look here, by carving it exactly as they did, please cue the animation, you will see that by looking at the building, from one orientation, you will see the exact tower that once stood there 10 years ago. But if you walk around Manhattan, from Queens, from Brooklyn, from New York, a different silhouette emerges. Squint your eyes. Right? A simple four-line sketch that is embedded in the mind of all Americans, and really all people around the world. So in, in carving the geometry of the building as they did, what did they do? They created a more structurally sound building. They created the building where they embedded the memory of the original tower. They were able to embed the ideological or patriotic ambition of the building and do so all in terms of one singular strategy that won't change whether or not the spire is one foot higher or one foot taller. Right? That, that's how architecture functions. That's how architecture can actually physically move you and impact you. Now I should say, just in, in wrapping things up, I did actually go back and finish my thesis and did graduate. And, and got my degree in architecture, thank goodness. And over the past couple of years, I've opened a practice and we've been designing buildings uh, all over the place in America. And it, in fact, we were very lucky. Our first, our first house ever built was finished uh, not but 15 minutes from here in Omina. But our most recent challenge, I think, for myself in terms of finding my voice as a designer came to us when we were asked to design a tower on the southern end of the World Trade Center site. And what was interesting is it's not a, uh, it's not a museum, it's not a tall office building, it's a, it's a courtyard Marriott, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I relish the opportunity because in the simplicity and, and frankly normalcy of that program, our challenge was to understand how to design a building that is connected to the site unlike any other hotel that is literally born of its, of its contiguity to the memorial, but at the same time that can function as a better hotel, a more effective hotel, a more sustainable hotel, and to try and manage those issues through one singular solid form. And even now, as I practice today, making both television and buildings, I think back to Mrs. DeVito, who taught me that architecture is not just made from glass and steel and concrete, but from culture and from climate and from history. Guys, thank you very much. <laughs>